birth order theory is a fascinating way to predict and explain personality. It isn't the only thing that can affect a personality, but it has a huge impact. In this video, we're going to discuss the different types of birth order, what kind of personality traits those people have, and discuss functional firstborns also. I will also be giving you tips on what you can do as a parent to help enhance the positive qualities of the different birth orders and to help improve upon those negative qualities of birth orders. But first, let me introduce myself. My name is Valerie. I blog at babywisemom.com. I have been blogging since the year 2007 and love helping parents love parenthood. I am the mother to four children, and ranging in ages from nine to 16 years old currently, and I am the oldest child in my family. And of course, be sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel. We will start with firstborns. Almost everyone watching this video has a firstborn child. If you are a parent, of course you have a firstborn. If you do not have children, you probably know a firstborn because you either are one or you have a sibling who is one. A lot of the traits of firstborns are very well known. Firstborns tend to be perfectionists. They're very reliable. They can be a little bossy. They're very organized. They are natural born leaders. They're very scholarly. They are precise, also critical, very logical, they are goal-oriented, and they love to please people. They trust authority figures and want to please them. So something that really turns an oldest into an oldest is that they are an only child for a period of time. The parents have never been parents before, so there's a lot of experimentation, there's a lot of focus on the child, and a lot of concern about the child. Parents can be hyper-concerned about injuries, or about making sure their child has the best education, the best opportunities. They applaud every little smile. Like there's never been a smarter child than when your own child first says a word. Like, of course your child's the smartest ever. And that is more true with your oldest child. By the time you're down several children, you're like, oh yes, of course. Like that's what babies do. Eventually they say words. So yes. Also smart, but it's less of a fanfare, less of this like, wow, smartest person ever. So an oldest child got a lot of attention and a lot of focus in those early years. And the oldest child spends more time with adults than any other child born into the family. And so that child learns to act like adults. We emulate people. Typically, children emulate the next oldest person in the family. So for the oldest child, they're emulating two adults who seem perfect, who seem to have it all together, who get it all right. They don't make as many mistakes, at least that children observe, as say your third child who's looking up to the second child, who of course is going to make a lot of mistakes and not be as precise or perfect as adults would be. So the oldest child is trying to emulate and be like their parents much more so than any other child in the family. This can bring so much pressure to the child and it's not just parents having a high expectation, but oldest children put that pressure on themselves. And so it's very important as a parent that you work to not add pressure to your oldest child's plate because your oldest child is already putting all the pressure possible on that plate. You want to help re alleviate some of that pressure and help your child understand that it's okay to make mistakes and that it's okay to be a child. Um, it's hard sometimes for oldest children to act like children. They feel like they need to be grown-ups. You want to be careful that you don't nitpick little things, that you don't fix things. If your oldest child does something and usually when a child does something independently, they're very proud and feel very accomplished. You don't want to come along behind them and redo it and fix it for them. So if you have your child vacuum the family room, don't then go in and vacuum after he's done. Let the vacuuming be good enough. Once you've turned that chore of vacuuming over to your child, let him do it. And 
it's not going to be as good of a job as if you had done it in most, most likely, but it will get there. It will get there if you let your child do it. If you need more help with chores and introducing them in the process, be sure to see my video or read my blog post all about how to introduce chores to your child. Something interesting about oldest children is they tend to not really like surprises. They really like predictability and consistency. So if you spring like a surprise vacation on your child, he's probably not going to be super excited at first. He may at some point get excited, but it may not be until he's reflecting back on the vacation. So if you're someone who really likes to give surprises, really think about like, does my child appreciate this surprise? Because for a lot of oldest children, they will enjoy something like a big vacation much more if they have time to anticipate and think it through and look forward to it and then experience it than if it's just thrust upon them. That doesn't mean you can never surprise your oldest child. Like part of helping someone is to expose them to things that isn't necessarily in their comfort level, but you have to meet your expectations and their reaction to who that surprise. A great thing for parents to do with their oldest child is to be sure to ask forgiveness when they make mistakes and don't be afraid of showing your child mistakes that you make. This will help your child realize these people that they're trying to emulate are real. They're human, they make mistakes too, and they have things they could improve upon and as do all people. Oldest children tend to really like to understand why behind things, especially rules. Their rule followers are going to follow it, but they want to know why the rule is there. They want to get it, they want to understand it. So just saying, because I said so, isn't going to sit well with your oldest child. As a parent, you need, a lot of times we can take it as a personal affront to us. If our child is asking why we have this rule, we feel questioned. Remember, an oldest child respects authority. They want to follow rules, but they also want to understand everything there is in the world to understand, including the rules. Explain why and your child will be on board. We can very easily fall into a trap as parents of giving our oldest child more responsibility than we give any other child in the family. It is normal to add responsibility as children get older. It can be wise for you to take note of when you add certain responsibilities. Not every child is ready for the same responsibilities at every age. So you can't just say automatically at age eight, every child will or will not be doing this, but you know, it can be good to note, hey, at age eight, we started having our oldest child load and unload the dishwasher independently. So if our fourth child is 12 and has never done that, maybe we missed the mark there a little bit. Maybe we need to make sure our fourth child is capable of loading and unloading the dishwasher. So it's good to be aware of when you introduce certain responsibilities so you can be sure to add those as soon as you feel younger siblings are ready. It's also important to add privileges as you add responsibilities. So as your oldest child starts to gain more responsibility around the house, he should also gain privileges. He should maybe get a later bedtime. He should maybe be able to invite friends over more or maybe be able to go over to a friend's house. Whatever it is for you that privileges would be, perhaps you have an increased TV time, whatever it is, they gain privileges as they gain responsibility. With the oldest child, it's really smart to focus on positive. Again, there's, they put so much pressure on themselves and they're so critical of themselves. They don't need you to point out all of their flaws also. And of course, there are times as a parent, you have to point out a flaw or a misstep or a problem. That is your job, but it's good to be really aware and not add that in when it's unnecessary. Also, another great thing you can do is to only step in to help your child when your child needs the help. Sometimes we can step in, we see the child struggling and we immediately step in and fix it for them. This can kind of lead them over time and it's just this kind of subconscious thing that happens where they kind of feel like, I can't do it myself or I'm not doing it well enough and someone else has to step in and do it for me. It wasn't perfect, I wasn't good enough, someone had to do it for me. So even something like tying shoes, we have to give ourselves as parents enough time as we're getting ready, as we're getting out the door to allow our children to try these things. 
and to make mistakes because that's part of a learning process and help when they need the help, but don't jump in before they actually need it. Next up is the often overlooked middle child. Middle children can often feel like they don't get a lot of attention. They don't get all the focus and praise of the oldest child. They don't get all of the cooing and gooing as the youngest child. They're kind of just, they're just overlooked. At, at least they feel like it. But something really fantastic is that middle children are typically the most well-adjusted adults. One of my favorite books about birth order is the birth order book by Kevin Lehman. And this is an old copy. There are updated copies since then. But something he talks about is that in his practice, he's a psychologist. He sees far fewer middle children than any other birth order. So he just talks about how well adjusted middle children end up being as adults. And that is in part because they really, they do not get as much attention. They do not get as much focus. And you know, it's not a bad thing for children to have those experiences, although it can seem hard as their children and looking around and feeling kind of picked on. But in the end, it leads them to be the most well-adjusted, the most monogamous, the most loyal. They're just, they have all these great, they're very cooperative, all these great traits that come because of their place in the family. Let's talk about some other traits about middle children. Something to know is that middle children are the least in a box birth order. So while oldest children typically are very easy to spot and youngest children are very easy to spot, middle children can often in many of their traits go one of two ways and they're very extreme opposites. A big part of that is because there can be a lot of different middle children out there. So if you're from a family of six, You've got a wide range of middle children in your family, whereas if you're a family of three, there's just one of you. So if a middle child is looking up to a middle child, that can really change their personality traits versus if a middle child is looking up to an oldest child. And also middle children are strongly impacted by the child just older than them. And sometimes this middle child decides to completely copy or completely compete with the next child older, or they can decide to try to be the complete opposite. And so there's these other elements to an individual's personality that impact where a middle child goes. So they really can have some extremes. Most middle children, no matter what other impacts they have, most are peacemakers and most are team players. Most put a very high value on their peer group. They're very into social life and they, out of any other birth order, are more concerned about friend groups than any other birth order. Most middle children are free spirits and most are quite loyal. They are mentally tough and very independent. They don't get as much focus, attention, or help, and so they become very independent. And because of this, they're, they're the most balanced. They're very balanced. So some of the ways middle children can go in opposite directions is one is they can be competitive or easygoing. And something very interesting in my own middle child is she can be both of these things. She can be very easygoing. She can also be very competitive. And it kind of depends on the situation and the circumstance, um, but she can be both. They can be very rebellious or they can be very obedient. They can be super aggressive or they can be the type that really avoids conflict. As a parent, it's very important for you to put some effort and focus into making sure that your middle child does not feel left out. Make sure your middle child does get some special attention, have some special traditions that are just you and your middle child or things that you do where your middle child gets one-on-one -on -one focus and attention from you. Something that's great to do is like a one-on-one -on -one parent date with your child or your child can have her own interests, her own um, talents that you celebrate and you support and you are involved with your child. Ask your middle child for her opinion on things. If you're talking about something as a family, because middle children are such peacemakers, let's say you're planning your next vacation. Your oldest child is going to have strong opinions and your youngest child is going to have strong opinions. Your middle child is going to sit back 
and say whatever whatever everyone else wants is fine with me. I'm fine with it. And they are fine with it, but it's also okay for them to have an opinion. And so encourage them to have an opinion, encourage them to share their opinion. You don't want to like change their easygoing peacemaker nature, but you do want them to understand and, and recognize everyone cares about what I think. And it's okay for me to have an opinion and no one will be mad at me if my opinion is different from theirs. Middle children can also often be pretty closed. Um, in an effort to maintain that peace and to not disrupt, they don't want to share when they're feeling upset or sad. And so they can kind of be closed books. And so something I really work on with my middle child is it is okay for you to have emotions and it's okay for you to share those emotions. It isn't bad for you to feel things. And it's okay if you feel something other than happy. So feel free to share those. And so it's important as a parent for you to watch that and recognize when your middle child needs some, some coaxing and some like, hey, I, I care about your feelings and it's okay that you have feelings. Another great thing to do, just super simple, is to make sure your middle child doesn't only get hand-me-down clothes. So understandably, it's financially savvy to use hand-me-downs with future children but do be sure to make an effort to get some new clothes for your middle child that are new and fresh. Um, get new shoes so they fit your child's individual feet and don't look totally run down. Just little things like that will help your middle child feel like they matter too. Make sure that your home is a safe space for your middle child, that it's forgiving, and that it's a place where your middle child can feel comfortable and feel free to express themselves the youngest child. We are all very familiar with stereotypical traits of a youngest child. Youngest children tend to be attention seeking. They love the limelight. They love to entertain. They love all the attention on them. They can be a little spoiled. They also tend to be outgoing and very charming. They're very good at getting people to do what they want them to do. Kevin Lehman calls youngest children personable manipulators. Youngest children are also very affectionate and very caring. As I talked about in the beginning, by the time a youngest child is reaching these milestones, the parents aren't as impressed as they were with an oldest child. And so the youngest child quickly learns they have to work harder to impress their parents. And the youngest child will see the oldest getting recognition and parents being impressed by what the oldest child is still doing because the oldest child is still the oldest and still the firstborn while the youngest child is there. And so the youngest child will look and see like, this sibling is getting attention and getting recognition for accomplishing these things. I want that too, because again, they're attention seeking. And so they'll work really hard to try to impress you. But youngest children do not have to work hard to impress siblings. Siblings will be very impressed by the baby learning to do these new skills because siblings are seeing these things for the first time. Parents often allow a youngest child to get away with more than they did the oldest child. And sometimes that is a correct adjustment. Sometimes you realize like, I was too serious about that or too strict about that. Sometimes it's honestly just that we're kind of getting lazy as parents. And so we have to really watch ourselves and evaluate like, am I allowing this to happen because it's what I should have always done or it's because it's what is best for this child, or is it just that I don't feel like dealing with correcting it? And if it's that, if it's that you're feeling like you don't want to deal with it, like give yourself a little pep talk, to fix that attitude and work on helping correct things that should be corrected. Parents also usually don't have very high expectations for the youngest, and that can be because oldest children, older siblings, have fulfilled any expectations. And so now it's just like, well, we've checked all those boxes we had dreams of initially. And so now whatever you do is is cool. Like do what you wanna do. Um, it can also just be like, we have a more reasonable outlook on what to expect from children. Youngest children are very persistent. They will do what it takes to get what they want. That might mean tears, that might mean tantrums, that might mean a song and a dance, Whatever it takes, they will do it. Youngest children are very likable and fun, but also very spoiled and self-centered. They can be temperamental, they can be impatient. 
A youngest child really needs you to make sure that you make an effort to give them responsibility and also that you maintain family standards, things that are super important to you. Make sure you keep consistent through your youngest child. A youngest child does need you to watch out for them. Don't let them be steamrolled. You know, older, older siblings can really gang up on the youngest at times and just, just put their foot down or make the youngest do what they want. But sometimes older siblings can really give in to those tantrums. I know my own children never wanted to hear their youngest sister cry at all. And so they would do anything it took to prevent her from crying. And I had to really teach them like, if you give in to every tantrum, she's never gonna stop having tantrums. And so they can go either way on those things. Make sure you acknowledge the accomplishments of your youngest child. Like when your youngest child starts to read, that is so exciting. Don't just be like, yeah, kids learn to read, of course. You know, be as impressed, or at least be impressed. If you were impressed with your oldest child, you're not going to be as impressed probably, but still be impressed. Still show excitement over reaching these milestones. Don't fall for the tears and the manipulation when your youngest child, like learn when your youngest child is trying to fake the emotion in order to get you to do what they want. Let them know like, yeah, I'm on to you. I mean, they can turn off and on those emotions like on a dime. So pay attention to that and don't let them manipulate you through emotion. An only child is very similar to a firstborn because obviously they have a lot of the same experiences, but then at some point they don't gain some of the things that oldest children gain from having younger siblings. So an oldest child tends to be very responsible like an oldest child, but also very spoiled like a youngest child. They get all of the attention, all the focus. They also get all of the pressure. There's no other siblings to take pressure of expectations and hopes and dreams off of them and spread it out. They act more like adults than an oldest child will. They don't get that time with siblings at playtime, that time to be a child. And they're often not very good at compromising or sharing because at home they're really never required to. They can obviously go out into the world and learn those things with friends, with play groups, at school. They learn some of those traits, but so much of your home life just really has a strong impact on you as a person. And so parents of only children need to be aware of those things and be sure they work to mitigate against those strong personality traits. One of the most fascinating things for me with birth order is when you start to look at functional birth order positioning. So a functional birth order is when you're not literally a birth order, but functionally you fit that role because of different situations. One of those situations is gender. So in my family, my firstborn is a male, my second born is a female, and my third born is a female. So my second born is a middle child, but she is also a functional oldest child because she is the first female. There are things that people naturally place upon genders of their children in expectations. And so as a firstborn daughter, there are going to be things that she has placed upon her and expectations she has that weren't necessarily placed upon her older brother. So even if you are the fifth child in a family, you can be functionally a firstborn and gain some of those traits. And so what will end up happening is you will have some firstborn traits and some middle child traits, or it could be some firstborn and even some youngest. If you are the first female but last child in the family, there's going to be some firstborn and youngest traits that you have. Another thing that impacts your functional birth order is the number of years between children. So if you have about five years or more between children, there's going to basically be like a restart of birth orders. So if you had two children and then had a five-year gap, then had two more children, then you'd basically have like two families. And of course, not fully. There are things, those second two, so your third child would be functionally an oldest but also a middle child. And there are things your functional firstborn or third child isn't going to have all the same kind of experiences as a firstborn typically has 
because you are not a first time parent anymore. You can also have situations where you have a functional only child. A lot of times families will have their children and then have a big gap and then have a surprise baby come along. And that surprise baby really ends up being an only child in many respects. So in our family, we have our oldest is a male, our second is a female who is a middle child and also a functional oldest child. Our third is a female who is a pure middle child. And then our fourth is a female who is a pure youngest child. So as you look at birth order with your own children or with your spouse, consider those things. Another impact that can affect your child's birth order function is what birth order you are. An oldest child is going to parent very differently than a youngest child. And so an oldest child parenting an oldest child, that oldest child who's being parented may be a little more extra oldest because they're being parented by an oldest. Where an oldest child being parented by a youngest who's more like chill and and whatever, go with the flow, then that oldest child may be a little bit more relaxed of an oldest child because they were raised in a more relaxed manner. So when you're looking at birth order, things aren't just super cut and dry, black and white. And again, there are so many other things that can affect personality beyond birth order, but birth order has a huge impact on your child's personality. So it's a really great thing to look at. It's really great for you to understand how you can influence that birth order it's great for you to understand the virtues and the vices with each birth order so you can help strengthen who your, what your child's natural characteristics and also help strengthen your child's natural weaknesses. We can turn weaknesses into strengths and there are things like a stubborn middle child can be a great adult who really stands her ground and doesn't give in to things. And so it's really important to help them channel that strength while allowing them to keep the strength side of it because every trait has a good and, and bad side potentially to it. So you want to help strengthen the good side of it while you help mitigate the negative sides of it. That is just a very high level overview of birth order. There's so much more that you can delve into. If you find it fascinating, you can go so much further. If you have any questions or want to comment on your own interesting birth order experiences, please always feel free to do so in the comments and I would love to read those. So thanks for watching and have a great day.